About 1,500 years ago, a group of people we would now call Vikings landed in an area that we would now call England and created a language which we would now call Old English. Fast forward to today, and people from over 140 countries are listening to a daily podcast about random stuff in a dialect we call American English. How did some ancient Nordic invaders lead to a language which is now spoken on all seven continents? Learn more about the history of the English language on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by Audible.com. My audiobook recommendation today is Our Magnificent Bastard Tongue, The Untold Story of English by John McWhorter. Covering such turning points as the Viking raids and the Norman conquest and the Germanic invasions that started it all during the 5th century AD, John McWhorter narrates this colorful evolution with vigor. Drawing on revolutionary genetic and linguistic research, as well as a cache of remarkable trivia about the origins of English words and syntax patterns, McWhorter ultimately demonstrates the arbitrary and maddening nature of English, and its ironic simplicity due to its role as a streamlined lingua franca during the formation of the British Empire. You can get a free one-month trial to Audible and two free audiobooks by going to audibletrial.com slash everything everywhere, or by clicking on the link in the show notes. Of the thousands of you listening to my words right now, I really don't know much about any of you. I don't know where you are, your age, sex, occupation, or even the device that you're listening to this on. However, there is one thing I do know. I know that everyone listening to this speaks English to some extent. Whether it's your first language or a second language, to some degree, you have to speak English. Most people who speak English have never really given the origins of the language any thought, other than maybe the fact that it came from England. English, to the surprise of many people, is a Germanic language. Its roots come from the wave of Nordic peoples who migrated to England from the area which is now Denmark, North Germany, and Northern Netherlands. These people came from tribes called the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. The name of these Germanic tribes are where the term Anglo-Saxon comes from. They basically filled the vacuum which was left after the collapse of the Roman Empire in Britain. They all had different dialects of Anglo-Frisian, Frisia being the northern part of the Netherlands. Over time, as these people intermarried, they developed a language which we know as Old English. This was very much a Germanic language, with only a few words from Latin which came into use from the adoption of Christianity. Most English speakers today would not be able to understand Old English at all. To give you an idea what it's like, here are the first few lines of the Lord's Prayer in Old English. Fadar ura, thutha arton havnum, sithi namaya halhut, tobe kuma thin richa, ya wortha thin willa, on arthan swa swa on havnum. Yeah, it's basically a foreign language. You might be able to figure out bits and pieces, but it's a far cry from the language that we know today. The next big change in the language occurred in the year 1066, with the Norman invasion of England. The Normans came from Normandy in France. Their lineage came from Vikings, which raided the area and then settled and blended in with the locals who were speaking Romance languages. Romance languages being those languages that were derived from Latin. The language which the Normans brought to England was Norman, which was a form of Old French with some Old Norse words that were mixed in from the Vikings. The Norman royalty didn't bother to speak the language of the locals. The court of the English crown basically spoke this Old French dialect for several centuries. Some kings of England did learn English, but they learned it as a second language and not as their primary language. The fact that the king and his court spoke French meant that if you wanted a place at court, you needed to speak it too. That meant the nobility, most of whom were Norman, were speaking French. The words from the Romance language, all originally based in Latin, began seeping into the English language of the common people. From the Norman Conquest until about the year 1500, you saw the rise of what became known as Middle English. Middle English saw major changes in grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation. The Latin-based words of the nobility heavily influenced the develop of English during this period. Middle English was the language of Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. Middle English can be sort of deciphered by speakers of modern English. Much easier than Old English, but it would still take some effort. 
Eventually, English, this language of the people, found its way into the upper classes after the upper classes had influenced the language for centuries. The first king of England who actually spoke English as a first language was believed to be Henry IV, and he would have spoken Middle English. The beginning of modern English began with what is known as the Great Vowel Shift. This was a large change in the pronunciation of words. For example, the word meat went from being pronounced met to mate to finally meat. The word boot used to be pronounced boat. The word bite was originally beat, then bait, and then finally bite. While the Great Vowel Shift was happening, spelling also became standardized. By the early 16th century, the language had evolved into something you could recognize today. This is known as Early Modern English. This is the English of Shakespeare. Some of the words are a bit archaic, but other than some these and thous, it's mostly comprehensible. You could probably travel back in time and have a conversation with Queen Elizabeth I, but it might be like talking to someone with a really heavy accent. Oddly enough, Queen Elizabeth could probably have a discussion with you easier than she could have with someone who was born a hundred years before her due to the Great Vowel Shift. The fully modern English that we know today can be considered to have arrived around the 18th century. Dictionaries published from that period could still mostly be used today. Around the time that modern English was developing, something happened on the geopolitical stage. England became a really big deal. The British Empire began taking over the world, and they took English with them. English went from an odd language spoken on an island off the coast of Europe to a truly global language. In some countries, they brought English speakers with them, like Australia and the United States, where the language took on a life of its own. In other countries, English was used by the educated local elite in the country, and oftentimes served as a universal language for large countries like India, where there were dozens of languages otherwise spoken. Empires rise and fall, however. Just because a country and a language might dominate at one point, doesn't mean that it will do so forever. Latin and French were once the languages of diplomacy and commerce in Europe, and both of them eventually fell out of favor. As the British Empire waned in the 20th century, it just so happened that the country which replaced them also happened to speak the same language, the United States. This time, the passing of the global hegemon torch from Britain to the United States also happened at the same time when electronic communication and mass media was taking off. English was the dominant language for motion pictures and popular music. Post-war organizations adopted English as their working language. The International Civil Aviation Organization, for example, recommends that all air traffic control communications be done in English, and almost all international flights are. The day-to-day -day working languages of most international bodies is English, including the European Union and the European Bank, even though the UK is no longer a member. Today, English is the widest spoken language in the world, although it does not have the largest population of people who speak it as a first language. There are more English speakers than Mandarin, and the vast majority of Mandarin speakers are only in one country, China. English, however, is an official language in 55 countries on six different continents, and it's the working language between research stations in Antarctica. By contrast, Mandarin is only an official language in two countries, China and Singapore, and Singapore actually uses English as their working language. Today, more books are printed each year in English than in any other language, doubling the number printed in Chinese. Likewise, there are more newspapers, films, and web pages in English than in any other language. The largest English-speaking country is, not surprisingly, the United States. The second largest English-speaking country is India, even though only 10-15% to 15 of the population can speak English. Given the size of the population, that still adds up to a lot of people. It's followed by Pakistan, Nigeria, and the Philippines. The United Kingdom has only the sixth largest English-speaking population in the world. In Europe alone, many countries now have over 50% of their population that can speak English. This includes Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Switzerland, Slovenia, Greece, and Estonia. Oddly enough, English is not an official language in the United States, which has no official language. Unlike some other languages, like French, there's no academy or organization which oversees English. It's a totally organic language. One result of this is that the language keeps evolving, and it's also affecting other languages as English words and idioms pop up in their native languages. This can result in hybrid Englishes around the world. 
In Singapore, Chinese and English are often used together to form what's called Singlish. Likewise, in Germany, you can hear people speaking Denglish. The influence goes both ways. Other countries where English is spoken will add words and phrases to English that might not otherwise exist in the language. Schadenfreude is a recent adaptation from German, and I've encountered the use of the word kindly instead of please in many countries, which came from India. English has developed into a global language, mostly by historical accident. However, how good is it at being a global language? Well, it has pluses and minuses. On the plus side, it's a very forgiving language. There's no correct accent. An Indian or Caribbean accent is just as valid as a Canadian or Australian accent. Simplified English can be very easy to learn. There's an entire Wikipedia that exists just for simplified English. There are no genders in English. Instead of memorizing if a word is masculine, feminine, or neuter, as in German, in English, every noun just uses the or a. English is really a marriage of Germanic and Romance languages. Although it has Germanic roots, over half of the words in English have a Latin root, usually by way of French. If you speak a Romance or Germanic language, there's probably something in English that you can already recognize. On the downside, the hodgepodge nature of English means there's a lot of things about the language that make absolutely no sense. The words enough and stuff rhyme, yet are spelled totally differently. We have silent P's in words like psychiatry. I was researching a possible episode on spelling bees, only to be shocked to learn that most of the world doesn't have spelling bees. They don't need to because their languages just make sense and everything is spelled how it sounds. So while basic English might be easy to pick up, mastering English can be very, very difficult. So what does the future hold for English? The number of speakers is only expected to increase, perhaps by a lot. The number of students learning English in India is expected to double over the next several decades. Likewise, the number of people who are at some stage of learning English in China, usually well below fluency, is believed to be as high as 200 million people. In a few decades, it's possible that China could have the largest number of English speakers in the world. English has achieved an escape velocity, where it's now well beyond the control of the countries that gave it birth. If a Norwegian is talking to a Korean while on vacation in Dubai, they will almost certainly be speaking English. As more people learn English, the incentive for everyone else to learn it will only become greater. It might never become the first language for most people, but it has already become the primary second language for most of the world. It could be that in a hundred years or more, the global language isn't English, but rather something which was based on English, in the same way that Old and Middle English were the precursors to the language that we have today. The associate producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is Thor Thompson. If you'd like to support the show, please donate over at patreon.com. There is content only available to supporters, merchandise, and even opportunities for a show producer credit. If you know someone you think would enjoy the show, please share it with them. Also remember, if you leave a five-star review, I'll read your review on the show.